so I remember about five years ago, we started talking about kind of the alt-right. And I, I remember I did a couple of shows, I think, on what was then kind of the Iran book show or something similar um, about the alt-right. Uh, and then, of course, we had an election and, and everything else happened. And uh, that's when I kind of noticed them and, and uh, the alt-right. And, it, you know, after the show, I got all this anti-Semitic stuff. And it was, it was pretty... It was pretty nasty, um, and uh, and they've been around since then uh, at the fringes, nipping away. And we'd be talking about this phenomenon on the right for a long time. But when when did this kind of come to consciousness for you? When did this issue uh, become real? And then what has stimulated kind of your most more recent interest in writing and engagement with this? Yeah. So. As you said, uh, four or five years ago, I think we both started hearing about becoming moderately interested in what at the time was called the alt-right. And, um, you know, I, th I, think the, I think the turning point event was uh, Charlottesville uh, and the protests in Charlottesville uh, and, and the aftermath of, of what happened in Charlottesville. And I think, you know, it shocked it shocked me. It shocked you. It shocked, I think, a lot of people uh, that there was that that there was this movement, um, which at the time consisted of a number of of sort of very disparate groups. I would say, um, from from you know neo Nazis uh, to various white nationalist front people, uh, various identitarian groups. I mean, I think the the coalition that formed at Charlottesville was actually a fairly, well, uh, fairly broad spectrum uh, group of people that loosely went under the name of the alt-right. Um, probably the most famous person associated with the alt-right, uh, and I think the guy who gave the name to it uh, is this Richard Spencer guy who was a white nationalist uh, uh, type. and. But with Charlottesville, the whole thing seemed to implode. And if, in fact, it really did implode. The alt-right died, I think, in many ways at Charlottesville. Um, and, and then it, that whole sort of movement just kind of, it seemed on the surface, uh, to my way of thinking, it kind of disappeared. Um, and then it was now, I guess, uh, two years ago that I became aware of uh, of a different kind of movement uh, that was not necessarily associated with the alt-right. And it was a movement that was primarily online that grew out of uh, places like 4chan and 8chan. Uh, and it was largely a, an underground movement of young people uh, who took Pepe the Frog as, as their mascot. Well, Pepe was really the mascot of the alt-right even five years ago. Maybe, yeah, uh, might might have been, uh, but Pepe only came to me sort of post alt right, you know. And th this was this was you know the the time of Milo Yiannopoulos uh, and 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 other people like that, and you know, and I, I started noticing that that young people in particular uh, were were latching onto this, you know the. I, I had been aware of following, had been writing on the sort of general generic right for quite a number of years. Well, we wrote a book together, right? On, That's right. Uh, on the neoconservatives. Uh, so. I did a book on neoconservatism and uh, I'd actually been sort of writing on the conservative intellectual movements for probably 20 years, even prior to the neocon book. And, you know, and, and, but the, 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 the right, broadly speaking, both conservative and libertarian, uh, was largely a movement that, was, that had increasingly become focused in Washington, D.C. and in the, the major conservative and libertarian think tanks, Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, Competitive Enterprise Institute, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it was a movement uh, at the time, and now you know, we're talking sort of um, 2000 up to maybe 2010 at the most. It was, it was a movement led by these white paper think tanks, uh, for lack of a better term. So in other words, it was a movement 
uh, it was a movement of grown-ups, you might say. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh, I don't know, I think around 2017, I became aware that there was this underground movement uh, of young people and they were entirely online. And uh, so I, I started exploring. I mean, I, ha I had a kind of a personal interest uh, in the subject because uh, I, 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 it turns out somebody that I, that I had known was, had been a part of this world, which I just, I knew nothing about. And so I started exploring it uh, and I quickly discovered, and you and I have talked about this, uh, this at the time, young 14 year old girl who goes by the name of Soph, who was putting out these incredibly um, provocative, I mean, that, and that's putting it mildly, uh, videos. Um, and, and she had a million followers on, on YouTube. And then there was this guy, Sam Hyde, who's very popular uh, on what I call the dissidents uh, right who and and he he had his own uh, his own TV show and um, and the guy was frankly kind of a madman and so anyway I just I started following this world and then uh, I think the turning point came in August of 2018. And interestingly enough, two, I'd say, important things happened uh, uh, that year. The first was um, Jordan Peterson's sort of disappearance. That's when Peterson just sort of fell off the map. Um, or maybe that was, I'm sorry, that was 2019. 19, he fell off the map in 19, yeah. yeah. And so in August of 2019, Jordan Peterson just fell off the edge of the earth. Yep. And he stopped giving talks, and I think most people know uh, his very sad story since then. Um, but the very same month, the Claremont Review of Books published a review by Michael Anton, who was the author uh, of the infamous Flight 93 election essay that really was a kind of catalyst uh, behind the Trump campaign in 2016. People don't know that essay. Can you quickly Give it a like a one paragraph summary. Yeah, uh, well, uh, the, the thesis is um, think of the 2016 election as flight 93 and you're a passenger on flight 93 and you basically have two options. You can just go down with the plane that's been taken over by terrorists or you can uh, against all odds, try and fight the terrorists and take back the plane, the plane. And maybe you have some small uh, possibility of surviving, but basically the argument- go down was, anyway, but at least you fought in a sense. But, but at least you fought. And and, some but, odds. But, yeah. But yeah, and that, that's how Anton viewed Trump's election. Uh, the, the left has become increasingly totalitarian. They are going to destroy America. Uh, Trump, for all of his vices and flaws, uh, is the only possibility to fight uh, the left. So you might as well vote for Trump. Uh, so Anton um, wrote a review uh, of a book titled Bronze Age Mindset by the perversely named Bronze Age Pervert. And up until that point, I'm not sure that I even heard of the book or of the Bronze Age pervert. Uh, but that review, which was a review that was both in awe and in shock of, of this book by Bronze Age pervert. But in, on the whole though, I would say the Anton review was, was generally speaking, at the very least fascinated by Bronze Age mindset, if not somewhat um, supportive of the Bronze Age mindset. And from that moment forward, uh, certainly in one small corner of uh, the online dissident right, particularly amongst graduate students um, in political philosophy, all of a sudden the Bronze Age pervert and his book uh, became the hottest ticket in, in, in town. And so um, the Bronze Age pervert uh, has a has a very large following on Twitter, almost sixty thousand followers on Twitter. He uh, he has a very popular podcast called Caribbean Rhythms, mm -hmm. and um, so th that's you know I, I started becoming very interested in 
what was happening with with the online dissident right and because you know uh, I'm a university professor I'm I'm interested in what young people are interested in and 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 with this larger interest in that I've had for decades now uh, in the on the right in, in you know an interest in conservatism and libertarianism um, I just started following this stuff and um, I, I'll well, go ahead. So, well, I, I mean, Anne has a question that where she's attempting to insult both of us, but uh, she says that you did a show on BAP a year ago from Bad Suggestion. It was actually longer than a year ago, but yes. Uh, at what point is the focus on the fringe right a way to steer clear of cancel culture? I mean, you're talking to Brad who has been, uh, cancel culture has attempted to cancel many times and has fought them vigorously on campus and has published up ads against them and has done you know all kinds of work with regard to cancel culture and i basically devoted i don't know 50 percent of the last few shows to cancel culture so uh what you want and what many of these people want is that we never talk about the fringe right because the only enemy the only enemy is the left and this is a good question i guess is it true that in the, you know, is BAP our friend because the left is our enemy? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not, right? So that's why in um, just almost a year ago now, so I guess in May of 2020, uh, I wrote this essay that, that has caused an enormous firestorm of uh, controversy titled The Rise and Fall uh, of the Pajama Boy Nietzscheans, uh, a, a title that you just can't get out of your head. And, um, and with that, then I, I have spent the last 10 months of my life uh, battling with these guys who have launched a kind of personal, um, not ideological, interestingly enough, but a personal jihad against me. And so if for some reason Anne thinks that Brad Thompson uh, hasn't been a victim of both the woke right and the woke left, she's sorely mistaken. I've spent an entire academic career uh, being uh, attacked and, and attempts to cancel me by both the right and the left. Um, and. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably one of the few people in history who's been foiled three times. Uh, that is, I've had freedom of information uh, requests where uh, you know hundreds of pages of my emails uh, have been produced uh, and 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 attempted to make public. So um, uh, this is this is a trend on uh, among certain uh, you know people affiliated with objectivism that. And it's a trend, I think, on the right more broadly, on the on the better right, that uh, there's only one enemy, and that's the left, and we should focus all our energy, all our efforts on that, and and ignore the right. So, I we've done two shows by Anne's own admission in one year, right? A year ago and now, and that to her is she's going apoplectic because of two shows, because we haven't dedicated every second of every waking moment to attacking Kelsey cancer culture, which is being attacked by us, but also by, you know, plenty of people. I mean, there's, there's a whole army out there attacking culture culture every single day. Anyway, back to BAP. So you published Pajama, um, uh, Pajama Nietzsche's, which is one of the great titles ever. And it got it, it really got them. It got people talking. But before we get to BAP, before we really dig into BAP, the article doesn't just go after BAP. I mean, and, and I don't want to present it as a BAP is the only force on the right that we think is worthy dealing with. Um, but it, it also takes on kind of the trad cons, uh, traditional conservatives. Um, so talk a little bit about trad cons and then maybe uh, broader, what, what, what you consider the dissident right and who, who, who counts within the dissident right? Right, so you know there there are all kinds of sub factions uh, in the dissident right. I've been primarily concerned with I think the two largest factions, uh, the so-called uh, Catholic trad cons or uh, Cath trads as they're sometimes called. On the one hand, and then uh, 
uh, primarily Bronze Age pervert and his followers uh, on, on the other hand. The, the Catholic tradcons, as they're called, um, in the essay, The Pajama Boy Nietzscheans, I take up primarily uh, two of the leading voices of the Catholic tradcons, uh, a professor of political science at Notre Dame, uh, a guy named Patrick Deneen, uh, who wrote a book called Why Liberalism Failed, and then Sorab Amari, who is uh, the editor of the New York Post. And, um, and, and, and what, I, what I try to do in the Pajama Boy Nietzschean's essay is demonstrate that both of these factions of the reactionary right are profoundly anti-American. And in fact, not only are they that, but they join with the left in their anti-Americanism. So in the essay, I begin with a critique of the 1619 Project, uh, and, uh, and then I turn to these, the, these two factions, which I consider to be equally anti-American. And they are openly and explicitly anti-American. So the Catholic tradcons, for instance, on the one hand, they wanna argue that all of the things that they regard to be corrupt, immoral, and evil in 21st century America. And this would be primarily on, on cultural uh, issues. So, uh, so Rob Amar Amari seems particularly exercised by dra drag queen reading hour, for instance, right? And, and but what Amari and uh, Deneen want to argue is that the, the nihilism and moral relativism of late 20th and 21st century liberalism is the direct result. Indeed, it is the culmination of the principles of the American founding. So for Deneen and Amari, there is a straight line between the Declaration of Independence and the Port Huron Statement, which was the, 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 the new left statement of the 1960s, that there's a direct relationship between uh, Thomas Jefferson's ideas and that and, and drag queen story hour, right? So it's one Gee, continuous yeah. whole. It's yep. the working out of those ideas. And uh, I, th that is just simply false. Well, uh, and, and, and they, they make a very specific claim, both there and, you know, in the whole Amari French, which was this fight within, within the right, you, you, I, I read a lot of kind of what, they, what these tradcons were writing. The, the real opposition they have is really twofold. It's the individualism, right? Individualism is what the left is about. And it's a, you know, rejection of community and tradition and, uh, and the state and the common good and the public interest and all that. So they reject individualism. They blame the founding fathers for instilling individualism and that the inevitable outcome of individualism is the left. And then in a sense, they don't do this explicitly. They reject reason. They reject at least the individual's capacity to think for themselves. And so what they reject is individual values uh, and your choice of values, your ability to use your mind, because again, that leads to subjectivism, which is what, what they blame that link between Jefferson and, 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 uh, and the modern left to be. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the way, the way, the way to sum it up is the founder's view is that the purpose of government is to protect the rights of individuals. For the Catholic tradcons, the purpose of government is to promote virtue and the common good mm -hmm. uh, or the, the public welfare. Uh, and of course, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of the common good is an anti-concept uh, that, that, has, that has no basis in, in, in reality. Uh, and so they, they are willing to use the coercive force of the state to make men good rather than withdrawing the force, the coercive force of the state in order to make men free. That's the, that's the fundamental difference between their view and the founders view. But somehow they believe that, that the founders emphasis on, on individual rights uh, in, and individualism leads to uh, the, the, what they consider to be the corrupt culture of the world in which we live today. And, and, and so, you know, the, you, you, might, you might describe them as central planners of the right, mm -hmm. whereas the central planners of the left want to, control, uh, want to control man's body. They want to control what, you know, what he produces. These central planners of the right want to control what he thinks um, and, and, and his, his, uh, his, his moral views. So, yeah. and, and I've noted, I've noted on my show that 
they now have a parallel in politics, which is that people like Josh Hawley and, and, uh, and others who, who admit to being central planners and want government to control much of our behavior. So there are people now in Washington who you know, manifest these ideas. And, and we know we've got new think tanks centered around these kind of ideas, um, one by Cass and another one I forget the name of. Uh, we've got conferences of conservative nationalists who these people all affiliated with. I mean, there is, this is more than just an academic movement. This is now an academic political movement. Yeah, it is. And the Catholic Tradcons, they, they tend to be somewhat more intellectually respectable because, uh, you know, they all have those fancy college degrees and, uh, and some of them teach it at, at, at universities and they have um, high powered visible positions uh, in the media and, and, and amongst the intellectual elite. Bronze Age pervert and his followers, however, um, you know, it's a movement mostly of young men, I'd say between the ages of 18 and 35. Uh, but with Bronze Age pervert and his followers, they likewise reject the principles of the American founding. So, you know, so what do they offer in its stead? So, you know, the, the, the Tradcons, we know what they offer in its stead. They offer kind of a traditionalist, authoritarian, you know, we're going to impose our values on you and we're going to guide society to be good. What is, what is BAP's, uh, BAP is short for Blanc J. Pervert. What is BAP's um, solution? What's his ultimate state? Well, I mean, BAP's philosophy is, there's a lot to say about it and it, it, much of it is, is profoundly convoluted, but there is, there is a kind of systematic philosophy, but to go directly to your question, I mean, what, what is the end point? What is the political end point of Bapism? It is uh, by his own admission and that of his followers, it is what they call Caesarism. So, I mean, you, and, and it's military rule. It's the military state that they are proponents of. And um, Bap uh, in the book, Bronze Age Mindset and on his podcast, uh, you know, you can see who is, he tells you who his political heroes are. They include Saddam Hussein, Muammar no. Gaddafi, no. Edward, yes, Eduardo Stroessner, uh, Juan per, uh, uh, Perón, yeah. um, uh, Salazar, um, uh, and Franco from Spain and Portugal, yeah. right? So those are the- There's a big revival and interest in Franco. It's interesting. He's considered yeah. the less bloody of all the dictators of the 20th right. century. And there's a there's a lot of people now coming out. Oh, Franco wasn't that bad. That, you know, unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So it's it, at the very least, it's strongman authoritarian rule. Uh, and uh, and and at its worst, it's it's and there and in the essays that I wrote after the rise and fall of the pajama by Nietzscheans, um, I, I've sort of laid out fairly systematically BAP's moral and political philosophy. And uh, it, 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 at, the, at the very least, it's flirting with fascism, if not uh, openly uh, supporting. If you uh, admire Saddam Hussein, you're, you're flirting with fascism. There's no... Um... What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it, but, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. 
it's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at yourunbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.